from Sugar 23. I'm Angela Ledgerwood and this is Lit Up. I have a very special woman on the line from Paris. Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on Lit Up. Thank you for having me. So everyone, Lindsay has a book out at the moment, her second book called The New Parisienne, The Women and Ideas Shaping Paris. And it is the most glorious uh, book. It's not only about this kind of myriad of women from all walks of life sharing their stories but it can also kind of be a guide to Paris an unconventional guide because they share the places they love and so we can all have a little bit of their Paris if we decide to go there ourselves. Uh, Lindsay has another book called The New Paris and we talk about in this episode how that book kind of led her to the specifics of women in the second. Right now she has a podcast that I'm an avid listener of called The New Paris Podcast. She just had a great Aussie wine store owner on and I love that episode. Now these are just kind of sparks of her work because it's quite prolific everything you do Lindsay so let's get going I'm so excited to be here I love the show because your book is all about kind of blitzing stereotypes about particularly the women in Paris I'd love to know like what was your day like today you know did you have a croissant and (laughs) you know is it okay if I still love wearing striped t-shirts Okay. These are, these are excellent questions. Um, I did not have a croissant today, but I did have a banh mi sandwich, which you could argue is equally as Parisian because the Vietnamese diaspora has been in Paris since the seventies. And so the banh mi is, is essentially, you know, as iconic and signature as the ham and cheese on a baguette sandwich. And Yes, definitely. I'd say the striped shirt will never go out of fashion. And, you know, you can choose one that's extremely well made and, you know, within the spirit of ethical fashion. And, you know, I'd say wear a St. James sailor shirt if you can. So absolutely. (laughs) Just even the the inspiration of Paris and France really infuses so many of us with such evocative imagery. Mm. And can you Talk about the transition from going from one book to another. You know, I think in my mind, it was like the most logical next step for the work that I was doing. When I think about Paris and all of the ways that it gets sort of romanticized or unfairly sort of compared to other global capitals as though they're truly comparable, the next logical sort of mental step for me is to say, well, who else or what else within the city is getting sort of unfair treatment a lot of the time. And my, I just immediately came upon women. And part of that has to do with the, the frequency with which you read articles, not only in women's magazines, although they're sort of the biggest culprits, uh, the, the, the guiltiest of doing this, but, you know, that sort of try to reduce Parisian women to sort of a set, a small set of characteristics and, and traits that can be sort of worn or tried on like accessories, which, you know, First of all, it's not meant to be attainable for everybody. And second of all, that's sort of not how it works. And I think I was getting, you know, the first book sort of stemmed from a frustration. I was really frustrated by the way that Paris was constantly portrayed. And anytime there was a critique of the city as sort of, you know, the capital that's losing its edge or not as relevant anymore, I would say, well, what are we focusing on? What are the metrics we're looking at? This is a city that's, that is changing. Maybe you're just not looking in the right places. And so the same frustration gave birth to the idea of the new Parisienne, because I think also we were, this was what, when I started writing it, it was 2018 and the discussions around Me Too were becoming global. They were becoming very prominent in France. The discussions around feminist issues were becoming even more prominent. And so it just felt like this was the time to strike. And of course, now we see all these years later that these issues are not going anywhere and we need more conversations and more books about these topics. Well, the book itself is so beautiful as an object. So even though 
We will talk about the serious issues that are kind of folded into its pages through the voices of these incredible women. What I love about it is that it's also, you know, it's revealing these women's favorite restaurants where they might go to write or be alone. And one of the questions I loved most, where is somewhere that you go just for you? Mm. And I thought there was such beautiful and kind of the stillness of that and the solo experience. My kind of version of Paris is walking around alone and being able to observe and take in and go down a corner or down a street that just appeals to you. And I loved imagining these women having a similar experience within their own city. Yeah, I, I, for me, it was important to include that element because I think the, you could call it practical, you could call it a bit prescriptive, but that element from my first book really appealed to readers, even though it wasn't designed to be a guide in any traditional sense, people used it as a guide. And and so I realized that that also was a good way to connect the two books and also really give a voice to these women as to how they navigate the city. And so many of them do, you know, the very things that tourists love to do in Paris, which is, you know, take time to cross the bridges of Paris and take in the environment and, you know, maybe listen to music or go across the bridges on their bikes because it's a different feeling. And I think it's, it taps into something else. You can read about their stories and their lives, but I think connecting it back to the place that people fantasize about uh, is actually something that felt crucial to me. Well, there are too many places I want to go. My brain's kind of saying, I desperately want to hear about your relationship with Paris and how you got there. But before we get into that, as I was reading your book and listening to your own podcast that kind of sprung out of the popularity of both books, um, I was struck myself with confronting the stereotypes I also still felt about Paris or the red lipstick that I feel, you know, or how do I do that effortless French dressing thing? So can we kind of unpack some of those traits? Because I think we'll all recognize how we've absorbed them. And then we can broaden that and have a talk about how these different women bring such diversity of thought, spirit, you know, physicality to a, to any city and how when we open our eyes, it becomes so much richer. The red lipstick is a, is a good starting point, I think, because for me, it's a, it's a sign of confidence when you see it. But to suggest that that is the most identifiable characteristic of, of any woman is sort of, or any group of woman is a bit sort of disappointing. You know, it's the, the Parisian woman were often, if we're talking about confidence, it's usually in reference to their look or their attitude, which is, you know, absolutely something to admire. And a confidence is obviously a, an important trait that we all can, should learn to take on. But I find it very limiting when it's only within the context of a physical appearance and a physical way of being when their minds and their ideas and their projects are less what we are compelled to talk about and, and, and to emulate. And so what I tried to do with the book was look at sort of where all of this came from, because that goes back to literature. I mean, it goes at least as far back as I was able to trace it to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, a Swiss, mind you, a philosopher and writer who was depicting women in a very particular light. And the Parisian woman was sort of excessively concerned with superficial matters. And so what happens when you have an extremely popular text at a time when the only way people are consuming ideas is through the written word and maybe art is that that travels quite quickly and it becomes almost an essential truth. So from there, you know, that kind of idea about Parisian women was then, you know, you would see it inspiring artworks, painters, you see it all the way up through the World Fair in 1900 in Paris when, you know, Paris was the epicenter. And so naturally it was a hub for the economy, for culture, but also for fashion. And so the association between fashion and style and aesthetics becomes so deeply entwined with the Parisian, but most specifically the Parisian woman. And so it's very hard to shake that off when you've already gone from, you know, the 18th century all the way up to 1900. 
at a time when the world is sort of convening in Paris and seeing these women firsthand. And, you know, they were sort of the the leading beauties of, of Europe. There was no one more fashionable or more deeply connected to etiquette and a way of being within clothing than Parisian women. And that is an idea that was just exported rapidly. And then you see it again during wartime when American GIs came through Paris and had certain ideas about the women being easy or, you know, uh, temptresses and some of the more sexual connotations that we have around, around Parisian women, whether they're correct or not is, you know, not even the most important element. It's really just how that gets integrated into common thought. And so over time, what you have is that these, these narratives, these traits, most of them tied to physical appearance or, or interest in very material things, ends up entering sort of the the common imagination, the common culture. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that they're all necessarily negative, but unfortunately it only reflects a small part of the population. So when you look at it today and you see how brands, many of which are owned by French conglomerates, LVMH, for example, or Caring, or any number of, you know, the tourism boards, Netflix with Emily in Paris. I mean, all of these brands and cultural artifacts and objects benefit from generations of this myth-making, and it makes a lot of money. And so it's hard for me to see how you can disconnect yourself from something that, and, and by yourself, I mean, you know, sort of consumers, but also brands themselves to say, is this really the full breadth of the Parisian we want to communicate to the world. And to be more specific, I'm, you know, I'm saying mostly a white, thin, able-bodied, heterosexual woman. And, and that leaves a lot of people out. And so when I think about the red lip or I think about the clothing that we, you know, that the magazines recycle and the books recycle about what the French have taught the world about style, I mean, as consumers in the outside world, I think it's it's sort of normal that we get sucked in. We look to anything we can to give us guidance. And the French girl look, for better or worse, in all of its, you know, failings, is a certain prescription. And the effortless idea is completely fabricated. They spend hours making things look effortless. But for me, the real message and where I hope people will challenge what they think about these looks and these, these, you know, or when they're reading something that depicts women in, in such a way is to say, what are they trying to get me to do? And is this, should I even be attempting this? I think it preys on insecurities. Well, I could jump to the idealist parenting styles, you know, all those <laughs> books about the calm children at the restaurant table, you know, eating frog's legs, you know, the the food that no American parent could ever get their kid to eat. And it, I guess it was so interesting reading your book because I hadn't realized just how powerful that had been. Mm. And as an Australian too, that that traveled far, that version of uh, how to be a woman. But also I think this because we're both people that left where we were from to go to a city that had a certain hold over our imaginations Mm. when, you know, before we'd even been there. So it's interesting to kind of dissect that power and then be drawn to a place, maybe be because of certain stereotypes, but then once you're inside of it and as an outsider, be able to see things that maybe are harder for Parisians to see how did you get to Paris? <laughs> and that must have been an interesting kind of disentangling as you became more embedded in the culture, but always being able to have that outside point of view. And the American in Paris in literature has such a storied history. Oh yeah. The, the American in Paris as a, as a collective is very strong. Um, it has not really wavered. So the, the idea of voluntarily leaving and choosing a place like like Paris, where, you know, obviously there's tremendous culture and gastronomy and a quality of life that's, you know, obviously very hard to compete with. I mean, certainly other places in Europe have, you know, a certain standard, I think, that's quite similar to, to Paris and other parts of France. But, you know, not all of them have the, the richness in the arts and culture to offer. But um I came, I started, I was a long time learner of the French language. So I started when I was in, you know, I was a preteen and 
not really knowing much about all of these myths that we're talking about, not really even yet having a, a clear idea of France's role in sort of global culture, in soft power, all of this, I was really fascinated by what it felt like to me to almost put myself in the shoes of someone else in speaking another language. And I kind of realized that it was it was like an, an open door to something else. I didn't know that I needed it. I didn't know that I wanted it so much, but the fact that I had this opportunity to sort of, you know, play a role, uh, another version of myself became what anchored me to French. So I studied French linguistics and uh, history and literature up through, well, my entire degree. So I, I, I continued through college and spent time in Paris. So I wasn't a Francophile in the way that many other people, you know, might talk about having felt enamored with the culture and, and the images and the fashion. I was taken by the language and then was, you know, blown away by the idea that we could live in a place as old as, as this. And that just felt kind of surreal to me. And I, you know, as a young person, I just thought, well, why would I choose to live somewhere so new and young? This is where, you know, everything happened. It, what's strange is that I became, you know, I sort of became an adult woman here and I started my career here. And that's actually... I think it resulted in me having a much more difficult time with my own self-acceptance because here I was sort of blithely going through the, this journey initially thinking like, this is great. I'm going to become, you know, bilingual. I'm going to be as French as possible, thinking that the language was sort of like the key way that that happens. But in fact, there were all these other, you know, shortcomings I thought that I had because I couldn't look the part. Well, I mean, I'm assuming that that was kind of around your 20s. It's such a defining, but it's also such a confusing time. We're so open to what the world will kind of spew at us. Whereas I feel like now, I mean, I'm just in my 40s, there's a a veil that's down that's kind of like, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. But you almost have to fend it off because it's still coming at us kind of in more clever ingenious ways. But can you talk a bit about that period of your life and what it was like then when you came back to the US and then came back to Paris and that ability, like you say, through a new language, a way of reinventing oneself? Yeah, reinvention, I think, is the operative word. And I didn't even think that's what I was doing. But ultimately, you know, there are things you're escaping. There are things that um, you definitely are trying to protect yourself from. Of course, that means you open yourself to other things, which is what happened when I was in Paris. But, you know, yeah, early 20s, it's very, everything is unstable. Um, I had to try to get a job here as well, which was also, you know, another another hurdle. So there was this constant feeling of, of falling behind. At once, it was like I I was doing something that felt like, I could excel here. I could become something. I didn't know what, but I could become something. But yet I was still very much one foot in the U.S. following what everyone, what my peers were doing and how they were, you know, already landing salaries that I thought I would never have and opportunities and, you know, maybe getting their first apartment. And I just sort of felt like, okay, is this, have I taken a detour? As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better. Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy. Available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Well, I'm wondering too if living in France, like there is an idea of working a little less, having a system which supports families. And whether that's true or not, I will ask you. But... I mean, living in New York now, especially in the 40s, and, you know, my friends next, we've all been watching Fleischman is in trouble and we're like, oh, <sighs> my God. You know, and so many in our friend group are like, I feel like that. I feel like we, you know, in a couple both have quite high earning jobs and it's not enough. You know, we can't possibly even think of having a family in New York. And then we have another friend on the group chat who's like, you guys are crazy. I grew up here. You know, my parents are teachers and like I turned out okay. I didn't go to private school. Like, but it's a conversation that certainly happens in this age group. And then we have friends in Paris and I'm sure 
you know, similar conversations happen as well, but maybe with the childcare being available, healthcare having that accessibility takes a slight edge off, but also a, as kind of a, what is the big dream for life? Is it to work, 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 work till you get the thing? I mean, what the thing is, it's so elusive, we don't know. My idealism of the the French way is that it's a little more balanced and it's far more focused on enjoying moments. Can you talk to me about that? Because of that back and forth, it's a unique point of view that you have. Sure. It, it, it is definitely real. I think balance is certainly something that I would say is an, an accurate way of describing the French culture at large. I do think there's a tension. I think even people who work in high, fast-paced corporate jobs still want their five weeks and you know plan to disconnect on vacation. But they also are drawn to being able to afford certain things, being able to afford these expensive vacations or not expensive, but just be able to afford period trips with their families. And the cost of living is getting higher. You know, there's more income inequality. And when it comes to childcare, I think one of the biggest issues that my friends face with young, young children is, okay, they have the care and they can get in and it's, you know, partially subsidized because it's based on your income as a, as a household. But you may end up having, you know, how many times a month, uh, your daycare that goes on strike, <laughs> Because this is this is also a culture of protest and, you know, and so my friends are dealing with this right now, actually, as we're having all of these pension reform strikes in uh, throughout France and the public schools will go on strike as well. And so, you know, if there's a national strike day, well, the kids who go to public school are not going to school. And that means the parents have to figure out what to do. So it's not that there's a perfect system. And the critics of of the French system, even healthcare, will say that it's eroding, that the, that you know they're indebted. It's not as good as it used to be. But regardless, there is an appreciation for sort of a humane way of life. Uh, there's dignity in being able to live decently, and that that is really the goal. It's not buy more things, take the most showy vacations. And I think that is really that that has become my value system ultimately. And so. Yes, the same conversation's happening here. I think people who feel like they've reached their, you know, they're getting priced out of Paris, well, they'll, they'll leave Paris. Um, and so there's that wave. COVID obviously amplified that as well. But there's still this sense, and that is, you know, distinctly French, probably Italian as well, of wanting to enjoy life, even if it's just sort of like, you know, a weekend getaway or a weekend with friends, a, a dinner you're taking that time. And I hope that they are able to preserve this value in their culture. Um, I, I think the sort of capitalistic tendencies are putting this at risk. But you, I think I notice it more as a, still a fact of life once I come back from the US. Yeah. It's so beautiful, that idea of a humane existence. And that's so different than I feel the goals in New York particularly. And I find when I go home to Australia, I find that's a more humane society and set of values mm. there and everything you're saying about living within a place but feeling somehow at odds with it resonates very much. You know, we can't all move to Paris, so how no. do we change? <laughs> how do we work, yeah, I guess, within our own lives to calm things down? Sure. And it's sometimes it's about also, you know, maybe making a change because it's ultimately better for your well-being. And I think that's what a lot of people did during the last two years, three years. And, and we're seeing, you know, inflation is really putting the pressure on on certain households here. But ultimately, I mean, all of these issues are things that are openly discussed. And I think the tensions are different than the tensions you I continuously read about in the U.S. There's not the same issue with violence uh, and school massacres and and all of these things that we sort of look at from over here and think, you know, like, is this the end of humanity? You know what? And again, it's sometimes very rich for the French to say these things because there are instances in their own culture that they don't want to address as equally as, 
inhumane or horrific, you know, whether it's racism, discrimination, anti-Semitism, what have you. And I don't know, it, it's always challenging when, when I talk about these issues with even with friends, because, you know, you can always say, yes, but France has done this. And what about the Europeans who have done this? And so you can always find a sort of counterexample. But if we're talking about sort of base level, humane and social foundations, then it's night and day with the U.S. Well, I want to talk a lot about books you love because we Mm. have you here, but because we've touched upon this and you've mentioned the word community, and I know that this is a very contested word in France, particularly in your book, before we get to hear the women's stories, you know, in their own voices, but also in kind of feature style that you've written, There's this fabulous glossary or, you know, explainer in the beginning that says, okay, Rita, in France, these are some big topics you need to understand for these women's stories to have the correct context. Could you explain why community may not mean the same thing in, say, the US, potentially Australia, UK, and in France? So, um... Before addressing community or communitarianism or communitarisme in French, it's important to understand that French is a universalist society. So they think that regardless of where you're from, uh, whether you were born in France, whether you were born to immigrant parents, you are first and foremost French under the eyes of the Republic. And as such, there's a sort of hierarchy of identities, right? So yes, you could say you're French American, you could say you're French Senegalese, but ultimately what's most important and certainly under the legal eye of the state is that you are French and that makes you all of us equal. I think it's a really nice ideal. I don't think it works in practice. France is a society that doesn't, since World War II, does not collect ethnic data or religious data. There's this idea that if they start doing a census and getting a a real breakdown on the population, that that becomes, you know, too close to what happened in with the Holocaust and 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 collecting information on people, um, and and how that could be abused. So okay, I, I understand it from that perspective. However, that means that there's really no metric or measurement to address when racism and discrimination are happening. In France, if everyone is meant to be French first, well, the idea is that there is no discriminating against people for their their origins or their religious beliefs because that all is secondary to the fact that you're French. Obviously, that's not how it plays out. Um, and so people do sort of convene. They, you know, they form groups, uh, feminist groups. They'll, you know, so groups to just to talk about women's issues. There'll be LGBTQ groups. There will be refugee groups. There will be whatever people who want to convene amongst other people who have similar experiences, which is totally normal. But the French don't look at it that way. It's sort of seen as a threat to the Republic. It is not looked at with great ease or comfort. It's not, it's not to say that there aren't, you know, organizations that exist where people come together. Obviously, there are churches, there are synagogues, there are these religious institutions, and there are nonprofit organizations, obviously, that work toward helping people of a certain, you know, orientation. But it's when they sort of convene and rise up, it's sort of seen as, whoa, 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 you're French. Why should you be sort of uh, coming together to come up as like a like a fighting block against the, the state? And anytime there are people who are sort of coming together, especially we saw it happen during 2020, during the Black Lives Matter movement that obviously took the world by storm, not just New York and, and all cities in America. And, you know, I remember participating in some of the protests here and the marches. And I think the view of the government is that this is like one big threat, communitarist threat, uh, this one big culturally ideological block that could be dangerous. And and that's sort of the perception. And, and it does make it difficult for people to say, okay, but how am I supposed to come up against or fight against the racism I'm feeling when you're telling me that it's not a thing, you don't have any way of measuring it, and I want to talk about it with people who experience the same thing. Mm, Thank you for explaining that so beautifully, because it it is quite a different 
point of view and to think that it's so embedded in the institutions is is important to know. And it's it's why there's, you know, these are heavily debated issues constantly. I mean, I've been in Paris for 16 years and it's the same. We we keep, they keep sort of harping on the same issues. So unfortunately or fortunately, um, yeah, we do a lot of talking about it, but, you know, we have yet to sort of say we can move beyond this. And I think it's because the powers that be don't really know how. Mm. But we're talking about it. And we know the French love to talk, so. That's great. Well, so do we. And we don't have much time left. So, okay, I have to ask, are there one or two books that you feel captures Paris in this more, I would say, exciting light? In an exciting light? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> well, books that have been either are in English or translated into English. I think the one that I go back to, which I think is a very true slice of life that I think pertains to the culture today is The Elegance of the Hedgehog. I don't know if you've read that, but you know, you you have someone, this this young 12, 13-year-old girl from a bourgeois family in this very elegant building. And there's Rene, the concierge, who we call the gardienne, you know, who takes care of the mail, who cleans the building, who's sort of the, yeah, the guardian of the building. But is obviously working class and is sort of looked down upon by everybody. But here you have these two unlikely characters, the teen girl and the, and the older gardienne who become friends and realize they're both sort of presenting themselves in a light that is untrue. Uh, the concierge who actually is far more intellectual and philosophical and interested in art than she would let anyone believe. And yet here is this teen who gets to her and, you know, they need each other. They find each other at a time when they both need that companionship. And I thought it was extremely moving, uh, funny, and honestly true to some of these dynamics. I mean, the the role of the gardien in Paris apartment living is just so iconic. Uh, we all have, we've, I, I had a woman in my, who over, oversaw the daily essentials of our building retired after 60 years. I mean, this was like, she was basically reared in this building and, and, you know, she was as much a fixture of this building as any of us. And so I thought, I, I, I think it's such a special story and I, I think it's still very much, tr you know, would be relevant to today in terms of a book I'm reading right now, which also takes place in the 1990s, but is there's the parallels to today are, are super obvious is um, it was a Goncourt prize winning novel from 2018 in French. It's called Leurs Enfants Après Eux, which in English is and their children after them. And it is by, because I have it right here, Nicolas Mathieu. And it won an award for translation actually into English. If anyone is, is interested in sort of knowing why it probably was translated so beautifully or why it's been popular in, in English and it really is a coming of age story that explores gender and sexuality and deindustrialization and environmental topics and so while it it really does take place in the 90s it feels so relevant to today and i'm reading it in french for my book club uh, but it exists in english and i just think it's a beautiful very compelling work wonderful recommendations thank you and one last one i, oh, I have to mention that is um it's it's lighter with some serious undertones but is the paris library that actually was a new york times bestseller and i'm so proud of the author who i who i know a little bit and and to see the work you know really soar and it, it's totally based on i mean it's historical fiction the american library in paris is a cultural fixture of Paris. Even today, I've done many talks there and I've attended many talks and it's really super important to the, you know, the literary culture. And the book is essentially the true story of the very heroic librarians who during World War II not only kept the library alive, but made books available to soldiers and Jewish members who had to go into hiding. So there's, there's a love story attached to it as well. The, this bibliophile who works at the library, but ends up sort of you know, having to contend with the Nazis marching into Paris and what that means for this space. And I think it was just beautifully told. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. What lights you up? Is it too easy to say my cats? I know it sounds so internet-y, 2021. It's all up but to you. <laughs> you can claim them. In, in this case, it's my cats, but animals in general and spending time with them and how they 
really connect me to the present, which makes me feel a little bit more alive and less anxious as a human. Um, they just give me a lot of peace and they've been sitting around me this entire time being very good boys, quiet little creatures. And I just, they're, they're like my anchoring force. So I'd have to say them. That's beautiful. I love that. Lindsay, thank (laughs) you so much for chatting. It's been such a pleasure. So I have to come to Paris to you do, to you. you do. I'll, I'll come back to New York. And how can we follow you? Like most people today, I am all too accessible on the internet. So you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Tremuda and on Twitter and on email or at lindsaytremuda.com. Lindsay, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Lit Up is a podcast from Sugar23. It's hosted by me, Angela Ledgewood, and is produced by Liam Billingham. Olivia Allmeyer is the marketing and editorial consultant. Mike Mayer and Michael Sugar are the executive producers. Andre Radofsky wrote the theme music. See you in two weeks.